Bonjour, good day. I want to start off by talking about what is becoming a very serious national crisis, and that's the crisis in our healthcare system. We've heard from a number of healthcare centers and hospitals that they cannot stay open, that some of their hours are being reduced because of staff shortages. There is a serious impact that has happened to our healthcare workers who are feeling overworked, burnt out, under-resourced, and we have to do something about it. We know as a result of the underfunding of our healthcare system, people are right now struggling to get the care they need. And people are worried. They're really anxious that if, hopefully it never happens, but if they need emergency services or any sort of care, will they be able to get it? Will their loved one be able to get the care that they need? Because, because right now what we're seeing across the country is uh, that question seems uncertain. The answer seems really uncertain because of, of the struggles. And I wanna acknowledge frontline healthcare workers are doing incredible, extraordinary things despite not having enough resources, but this is serious. And so today we have with us, we're really honored to have the president of the Ontario Nurses Association, Catherine Hoy, who'll talk a little bit about what this means for nurses, particularly who are among some of the, uh, some of the hardest working people, but who are faced with uh, the the overtime hours of, of working long days, not having time off, uh, being under-resourced, understaffed, and how difficult that is, and, and how many are leaving the profession as a result. And so we are, are feeling the, the impact of that. We're also calling for some solutions because we know this is very serious, but there are solutions. First and foremost, the federal government has a role to play, and Prime Minister Justin Trudeau needs to show up. He has not been present when the premiers have called for meetings talking about increasing the healthcare transfer, we know our healthcare system needs more funding and has needed that for years. In fact, decades of liberals and conservatives being in power in Ottawa has meant that our healthcare funding, which used to be 50 50 between provinces and the federal government, has been eroded to the point that it's hovering around 22% that the contribution is at the federal level, which is abysmally low and directly is contributed to some of the underfunding that we're seeing across the country. But there's other things that we can do, and we're calling for two specific things that this government can do right now. There are a lot of internationally trained healthcare workers that need to get qualified and want to work in Canada, want to contribute, but can't because of barriers, whether they're immigration barriers or qualification or recognition of their international training. And so we need to have a federal approach to accelerating that in Ontario alone, there's 15,000 nurses that are internationally trained that could uh, contribute if, they, if there was a path to accelerate their, their um, recognition of their skills. We also know that long-term care homes have been in a, in a dire crisis since the beginning of this pandemic. In fact, before the pandemic, the pandemic has just exposed the problems. And this government, the Liberal government, the federal government, Prime Minister Trudeau promised to increase the wages of long-term care workers to at least $25 an hour, and also talked about hiring at least 50,000 new long-term care workers. And we know many of our loved ones, seniors, are in hospitals waiting for a bed in a long-term care home because they cannot find one. And they are left in a hospital, which is not ideal for them. That's not the, the place where they need to be. They need a long-term solution. And what happens as a result, it means there's less resources for people with any acute or trauma or uh, immediate needs in a hospital setting. So we could free up that space by making sure our loved ones are able to go to a long-term care home, which is properly resourced with enough staffing. So these are some of the things that we can do immediately. The Liberal government can fulfill their promise to hire more long-term care workers, increase the salaries to at least $25 uh, an hour, and to make sure that we invest in ensuring that we have an accelerated pathway to recognize some of the internationally trained healthcare workers that want to contribute here in Canada. Um, with that, I want to introduce, uh, again, the president of the Ontario Nurses Association, Catherine Hoy, who's been a long, ad longtime advocate um, about healthcare, about the condition of nurses, and about what we need to do to make sure that we've got a vibrant healthcare system that includes um, well-supported nurses in our system. And so I invite Catherine to share uh, what she's seen and what she's heard from her members and some of the things that we need to do. Catherine, thank you so much for being here. The mic is yours. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. And I have to say, you are very in tune with what healthcare needs. So I thank you very much for that. 
I am a Canadian and I believe in public health care. Your paycheck should never determine whether you have the right to care or to be quite blunt, whether you have the right to live or die. I am the provincial president for the Ontario Nurses Association. I have 68,000 members and 18,000 graduates, graduating students in the next four years. And today I'm here to talk about national health care and the crisis that we're in and to help provide solutions that all levels of government can work towards. It takes all of us together. It's no surprise through the national nursing shortage, every province is experiencing it. Decades, and I mean decades, of neglect from governments. The passing of the wage suppression, Bill 124 in Ontario, shame, and the similar Bill 28 in Manitoba, and the ongoing pandemic have given nurses no choice, no choice at all but to leave. In Ontario, the Ford government's policies have sent many nurses to alternate careers. Early retirement, they didn't want to leave, but they were forced to leave. Or many have gone to work in private agencies, nursing agencies. And what does that do for us? It costs taxpayers thousands and thousands of dollars that doesn't need to be spent lining the pockets of private agencies. With wages not keeping up to inflation and the lack of recognition for their value, and I mean unmanageable workloads, unmanageable. And I want to just take a moment and talk about silent closures. We hear in the press a lot about emerge rooms closing, but there's a lot of silent closures that are going on. Eight beds here, two beds there, and they all add up in the province. My nurses and my healthcare professionals, they're exhausted and they're suffering from PTSD. They were not built to see the amount of pain, suffering and deaths that they have seen. And that is why many of them are leaving the profession prematurely. To make matters worse, physical, violence, verbal, against our nurses and all our healthcare providers has increased by 50% since the start of the pandemic. You know, you go to lunch at the CN Tower and you go through a metal detector, but guess what? You can walk into any hospital with a knife, a gun, and my healthcare workers, my nurses experience that. As a result, the government of Ontario must fund at least, and I mean at least 22,000 RNs just to catch up to the national average. But you know what? We need 30,000. Canadians across the country are feeling the negative impacts of government inaction and this piecemealing, piecemealing that they're trying to do to give care. In Ontario hospitals, wait times have ballooned to 20 hours. Many have had to close their emergency departments and ICU beds, and life-saving surgeries and treatments like chemotherapy continue to be put on hold. Chemotherapy can be life-saving, but more often now, it could just become adding a few extra months onto your life, and that's wrong. All levels of government have a responsibility to ensure that Canadians have access to high quality public health care. Though we welcome the federal government's recent injection of funds through the Canadian health transfer, there needs to be a long term sustainable funding and must and must I stress be for public health care. In Ontario, Owen is increasingly concerned with the provincial government turning towards private care to address the surgical backlogs and other testing. Instead of properly funding the system we have, a public health care system, there is plenty of evidence that worse patient care outcomes come from private care. And we simply just cannot go down that road and put our Canadians at risk. Instead, we could use this funding to retain, return, and recruit nurses and healthcare professionals by a few simple things. Improve paid benefits and workloads. Expand funding and access to mental services, mental health services. 
funding new jobs for late career and retired nurses to mentor and support nursing students and new nurses and the internationally trained nurses. The internationally trained nurses, we can tap into a wonderful resource there, but those nurses are going to need orientation, mentoring, and support. And with the nurses that we have in the system right now, there is not that. It is not available. We need to support trainees in underserved communities and sectors, increase financial support for nursing students, expand and fast track streamlining bridging programs for RPNs to become RNs. Coupled with financial support, ONA calls on the federal government to create a national healthcare workforce body to help coordinate a fulsome plan right across our wonderful country. We know that provinces are poaching nurses and healthcare professionals from neighboring provinces, so this doesn't address the issue. We're supposed to be one and support each other. Instead of implementing piecemeal solutions, this body can ensure that we implement a holistic plan with solutions to address the local realities in each province. Lastly, the federal government must continue to play a role in addressing the violence that nurses and healthcare professionals face every day. I don't think the average Canadian knows the amount of violence that a nurse experiences. Stabbings, shootings, punching, kicking, spitting, it happens every single day. So we call on the federal government to create a pan-Canadian violence prevention framework, targeted funding for violence prevention infrastructure. Decision makers need, they need to act like their lives depend on these solutions because guess what? They actually do. We remain committed to high quality public health care and safe, dignified working conditions for nurses and healthcare professionals across the province. ONA welcomes the opportunity to work together with the federal government to address the crisis. And Prime Minister, I invite you for a face-to-face -face conversation with me. Ontario is in trouble as all your other provinces. Use the resources that you have. We are here to help. Thank you. Thank you so much. You just heard from uh, ONA, Ontario Nurses Association President Catherine Hoy. You can hear for the passion, uh, the, the solutions that she's provided, and the steps that we can take at the federal level to provide real, meaningful support to deal with what is a crisis that, as Ms. Hoy pointed out, not just in Ontario, but across the country. She represents Ontario, but this is something that we're hearing from and we're seeing in provinces and territories across the country. We are in a really uh, difficult time that requires some immediate steps. Donc, uh, je veux euh, aussi euh, mentionner que euh, ce qu'on qu voit à ce moment à travers les pays, c'est vraiment une crise dans notre système de santé et on doit agir. Euh, c'est clair que à, à cause d'un manque de, de ressources humaines, à, à cause du fait qu'on a, on a trop de travailleurs de première ligne qui travaillent trop avec un, un manque de ressources, et on est dans une crise. Et on a entendu les fermetures des centres de soins de, san de, de, de santé et euh, des, des services d'urgence. Donc, c'est vraiment une crise et on doit agir. Donc, premièrement, ce qu'on exige le gouvernement fédéral de faire, c'est de rencontrer les premiers ministres des provinces. Ils ont demandé une rencontre. Donc, leadership, c'est de répondre à une crise. Pas de chercher des excuses, mais de chercher des solutions. Donc, Premier ministre Justin Trudeau euh, devait, il doit euh, rencontrer les, les premiers ministres et parler de comment on peut augmenter les transferts en santé. Mais aussi, on a proposé deux autres solutions pour répondre immédiatement à cette crise. On a entendu euh, la présidente des infirmières en Ontario et elle a expliqué comment la situation est grave en Ontario et comment c'est une situation pas seulement en Ontario, mais à travers les pays. Donc, les solutions qu'on propose euh, euh, immédiatement qu'on peut faire, euh, Madame Roy a, a résumé les autres solutions qu'on doit prendre au niveau fédéral, mais je veux cibler deux solutions spécifiquement. Premièrement, le fait qu'on a 
en Ontario, par exemple, 15 000 infirmiers qui ont de la formation internationale, qui n'ont pas euh, la reconnaissance de leurs compétences ici au Canada, en Ontario. Euh, on a plusieurs infirmières à travers les pays qui sont dans la même situation. Les gens avec la formation internationale qui n'ont pas la reconnaissance de leurs compétences pour, euh, pour travailler ici au Canada. Donc, on doit accélérer un système national pour reconnaître leurs compétences ici au Canada. Ça, c'est quelque chose qu'on peut faire. Et c'est une ressource, comme Mme Roy a dit, une ressource énorme où, ici au Canada, les gens qui veulent travailler, qui peuvent travailler, mais à cause d'un manque de euh, reconnaissance de leurs compétences et aussi des barrières d'immigration qui, qui euh, font en sorte qu'ils ne peuvent pas contribuer comme ils veulent. Deuxièmement, euh, le, le, pré, le premier ministre a promis d'augmenter les ressources humaines euh, dans nos, les centres de soins de longue durée. Et c'est vraiment un problème parce qu'on a des aînés qui sont dans les hôpitaux, qui cherchent un une, une lit, euh, un espace dans un centre de soins de longue durée et qui ne peuvent pas trouver un espace. Si on augmente les nombres des travailleurs dans les centres de soins de longue durée, on peut éliminer cette barrière, on peut trouver plus des espaces pour nos aînés, s'assurer qu'ils ont de meilleures qualités de soins dans les centres, centres de longue durée. Donc, deux promesses que le gouvernement libéral, que le premier, le premier ministre Justin Trudeau a fait, c'est d'augmenter le salaire pour les travailleurs jusqu'à 25 dollars et deuxièmement, deuxièmement d'embaucher euh, au moins 50 000 nouveaux personnel nouveaux travailleurs et travailleuses dans les centres de soins de longue durée. Ça, c'est quelque chose qui va vraiment aider à notre système de santé en général. Et c'est une, une demande, c'est un besoin urgent. Donc, on exige le gouvernement de montrer le leadership. Ce n'est pas de leadership de dire on ne peut pas faire rien, on ne peut rien faire. Ce n'est pas notre compétence. C'est la responsabilité du gouvernement fédéral de répondre à une crise nationale et avec les soins de santé, c'est une crise nationale, avec des solutions concrètes que le gouvernement fédéral peut prendre pour répondre à cette crise. Merci. Thank you. And thanks again to uh, Ms. Roy. Uh, with that, we're ready for any questions that you might have. And we'll start with questions in the room. For those of you joining us via the Zoom platform, please use the raise hand function to uh, notify us of questions. Allons commencer dans la salle. Pour ceux qui se joignent à nous via Zoom, utilisez la fonction levez la main pour poser votre question. And I just also want to clarify, if you do have any questions specifically for Ms. Hoy, uh, from the perspective of nurses, um, um, Ms. Hoy is prepared to respond to those as well. Ms. Hoy? Thank you very much. Uh, Laura Osmond, the Canadian Press. I wanted to ask you about long-term care. A safe long-term care act is one of the conditions of your supply and confidence agreement with the Liberals. Do you expect to see that legislation tabled in the fall session? And What needs to be in that legislation in order to meet the spirit of the agreement between the Liberals and the NDP? So we've outlined a number of steps that need to be taken, and, and each of those steps we've also outlined um, a, a timeline for it. So immediately for us, uh, this, by the end of this year, we've outlined the, the first step in terms of what we want to see accomplished in healthcare specifically was to make sure that kids under 12 had uh, the ability to make sure that their, their teeth were looked after, that families could actually support their kids to get the, the care that they needed. So that's the first step, and we're, we're very confident we can achieve that uh, before the end of the year, as our agreement outlines. A in addition to that, there's a, a top-up uh, Canadian housing benefit top-up of $500 that will go to about a million Canadians. Those are two specific things that are in our timeline for this year. But for subsequent years, one of our conditions is indeed to have legislation in place that outlines Um, good care at the at the uh, in long term care, and and that care has to follow the best practices that we've seen and that we've heard from from provinces and, ter and territories. We've seen in this pandemic, sadly, what has been the worst care, and we've seen examples of uh, of less than 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 appropriate care. And what that means is when the care is substandard. We lose lives. We lose our loved ones, and and that is simply wrong. So we want to see the legislation follow in the spirit of what we've learned, uh, the terrible pandemic toll that that seniors bore the brunt of, 
has to be a moment where we actually improve the quality of care. And so we need to learn from that. And uh, the spirit of what we're hoping, the spirit of what uh, we want to see in this legislation is to reflect the lessons learned from the pandemic and improve on the quality of care nationally uh, by implementing legislation that outlines what that care would be in light of what we've learned. The government did ask for specific standards for long-term care from the Canadian Standards Association, the Health Standards Organization. Um, those standards are nearly finalized. They're going to be finalized by the end of the summer. Are those the standards that you expect to be legislated? And given that they are nearly approved, how quickly does the government need to act in order to instate them? Uh, well, we want to see action on this immediately. Uh, we, we need to see that that standard of care be legislated and we want to see that implemented as quick as possible. Uh, sadly, we're still seeing um, some horrible examples of, of lack of good care in long-term care homes. And it cannot be that what we witnessed in the pandemic when people saw the conditions in Ontario and Quebec and some of the for-profit long-term care homes, some of the horrific things that we learned of, those cannot continue in our country. The fact that uh, we, when compared to the rest of the world, had some of the worst outcomes for seniors in Canada, a G7 nation, which prides itself on our healthcare system, that simply can't continue. So our goal ultimately is that we no longer see seniors bearing the brunt of any sort of healthcare crisis. We want to see that seniors receive the best care possible. And so that's ultimately our goal. And we want to see the quickest implementation of the best qualities and best standards, uh, best quality of care and best standards so that we can prevent any losses moving forward. But we also want to make sure that it's not just the, the legislated uh, standard of care, but also some of the things that I've outlined. We need to make sure that there's sufficient workers. And that means making sure we have good conditions of work mm -hmm. and appropriate levels of, of hiring of nurses and other healthcare workers. And specifically, we also know that this government has promised, rightly so, but they haven't delivered on increasing the pay for long-term care workers to $25, as I mentioned earlier, and in addition to hiring a significant number of new long-term care workers so that we have the sufficient number of workers that can work in one facility, not move between facilities, as one of the things that we learned was that moving between facilities resulted in, in disease spread. So there's uh, there's some concrete steps that can that can be taken nationally to support better care and better outcomes for seniors in addition to the, the standard of care. Next question will be online. Annie Bergeron Oliver, go ahead. Hi, thank you for taking my question. Um, I'm, my question is for both Mr. Singh and, and Ms. Hoyt. Uh, I'm looking to get a little bit of information on how big the problem is with the immigration backlog. I spoke to a nurse earlier who said that she's registered to work in Ontario but can't because her work permit is stuck 26 months later. In your experience, how big of a problem is this? And do you believe that the federal government should be looking at specifically targeting nurses, nurse practitioners, RPNs, and other qualified healthcare professionals to try to fast track their applications so they can start working in hospitals and other healthcare settings? This is actually a huge problem. We had a press conference with some of those nurses uh, in specific, but it, it applies to a number of healthcare workers. But we had a, a press conference with some nurses that are qualified. They have done their exams. They have taken every step and they've met all the requirements. They're internationally trained, but they have received their, their qualification in Canada. But the singular reason why they cannot contribute right now is because of an immigration delay. And that is a significant problem. Uh, we met with these nurses uh, earlier this year and they outlined how there are uh, a number, a huge number of nurses that are able to are able to work, are qualified to work, but cannot work simply because of their immigration status. So uh, I would love to give you some more numbers and, and some specifics around that, but this is a, a significant contributor to um, the, the lack of uh, frontline healthcare workers. The fact that our immigration system is so in uh, in disarray and, and folks uh, who are who are trying to apply for, for visas or to meet with family members can also attest to the fact that the system is incredibly delayed. But what we wanna see and what we proposed before was a specific fast track for healthcare workers because we know we need them and because we know that it's a desperate situation and, and these are workers that are already qualified. Uh, so we have called on the government to provide or to implement a fast track to immediately deal with the immigration status of these workers who again want to work, are qualified to work, 
but simply cannot because the, the federal government's immigration system is so backlogged. So it is a real concern. And I've met with these nurses, at least some of them, and spoken with them about how, how frustrated they are because they want to work. We need them to work. And there's an immigration um, barrier that this federal government is not supporting or not dealing with. Um, I am going to invite uh, Ms. Hoy if she has any additional information around the immigration backlog that's preventing. No, Okay. Um, and Ms. Hoy doesn't have additional uh, details on this, but uh, I, I would uh, encourage my team to follow up with you to provide you with some more details from the group that we met with that, that uh, outlined how serious this is. Right. And my follow-up is just sort of along the same lines. Uh, you mentioned that you did meet with the federal government and you had been telling them to implement a fast track for these types of individuals. I'm wondering, what do you think is their delay or their hesitation in doing so in implementing a specific fast track for healthcare workers who have the ability to work except for their immigration status? There is no excuse for this. Uh, I, I met with the nurses and we had a press conference and, and they outlined how they have the qualifications, they took all the steps necessary, they did the testing and they are qualified. And they, they highlighted how the only barrier they have right now is their immigration status and that their applications have been backlogged, they've been waiting, and you mentioned in some cases for months and months. Uh, that is a serious problem and I can't uh, understand, there's no excuse for this. I can't understand why the government is not willing to do this. Uh, when it comes to the immigration system, generally speaking, it is far under-resourced uh, and, and the response times and the delays are just unacceptable, They're just completely wrong. So I, I have not heard any justification for why they, the government won't move on this. Uh, we'll continue to put pressure because it is a solution that uh, not only approving or fast-tracking the immigration status of nurses that are already received their qualification in Canada, but also looking at ways to accelerate uh, the the support needed to get those other nurses and other frontline healthcare workers qualified in Canada. Ms. Hoy outlined uh, some mentoring and supports that existing nurses in, in various jurisdictions, but here in Ontario, for example, or across the country, could provide mentorship services to help those nurses get their qualification. But we need to respond in a, in a real urgent way because these are folks that can work, should be working here, want to work, and we need to be able to make sure that there's a streamlined process so that they can contribute. La prochaine question, the next question, Guy Kenville. Go ahead. La parole est à vous. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Uh, this is a question for, for Mr. Singh. Uh, this again relates to the confidence and supply agreement that you have with the Liberals and how that sort of relays back to the letter that you've sent the Prime Minister and your, your announcement today. Uh, sorry, let me just get my question in front of me. <laughs> no problem. In your letter, you don't really talk about any sort of political consequences uh, that might result if you don't see action from the Liberals uh, in terms of the things that you're asking for. So the question is, are you prepared to withdraw your support from the confidence and supply agreement if you don't see movement on the suggestions you've made today? And uh, to the extent that you haven't already talked about it, what is your time frame for some of the specific asks you've outlined? today. So two-parter there. Sure, sure. Uh, really, at the end of the, the cost is that the Canadians are going to lose their lives. It, it's as serious as that. Uh, Ms. Hoy made that, that argument as well. If we do not have the resources necessary for Canadians to be able to get the care that they need, and that means making sure that we have enough nurses hired, that we have enough healthcare workers hired, and that we have enough long-term sustainable funding in our healthcare system, the result will be that people will lose their life. And that is a decision that this federal government has to make. Are they willing to pay that price? Because that is what's at stake. Uh, we know that already there has been an impact because of the lack of resources, the lack of funding in our healthcare system, people have not been able to get the care that they need. And, and that is a serious cost. We are calling on this government to respond to this crisis. Premiers, have been calling on this government, have been calling on Prime Minister Trudeau to show up to meetings to deal with the fact that there are not enough, there's not enough healthcare, uh, federal healthcare funding transfers to meet the needs of Canadians. So that's the cost. And, and we're, we're the voice of people who are saying we need to make sure our healthcare system is there. And as Ms. Hoy also pointed out, we also want to make sure it's there in a public system, 
It should not matter how much you earn. It should not be that if you've got deeper pockets, you get better care. That is not what Canadians want. We want a system that is there for everyone of the highest quality. We also know the evidence is clear. When we have a public system, everyone actually gets better care. The overall care is better and our care and our dollars go towards uh, a more efficient and better outcome of, of where we put our money and the outcomes that we get for it. So we want that. And that's, that's what we're putting to, to the prime minister. Invest in, in the solutions, show up, be a leader. It is not good enough uh, to say this is a provincial matter and then wash your hands of it. The federal government has a role to play and that's the pressure that we're bringing to bear. The stories of people, uh, the frontline healthcare worker stories. Uh, Ms. Hoy represents thousands and thousands of workers, thousands and thousands of nurses, and many of whom are leaving the profession because they cannot stay in these current conditions. So that's what the urgency that we're bringing to the table, the stories that we're hearing from emergency rooms that are being shut down, the silent closures that Ms. Hoy mentioned, where when you've got so few beds, that, that, that center is effectively closed or effectively not operating in, in a way that responds to the needs of that particular community. So this is the, the crisis that, that we're up against and we're, we're calling on the government to act uh, given that seriousness of the crisis. When it comes to the confluence and supply agree, uh, agreement, we've laid out specific steps that need to be taken. And if those steps aren't taken, we can withdraw our support. We're using that agreement also as a leverage to, to ask for more, to push for more. It represents a, ce a, a floor, not a ceiling. It represents a floor of what we've come together and agreed upon and, and things that we need to see for the agreement to continue. But it doesn't limit us for, to ask for more to ask for things that are outside the purview of the agreement. And this crisis that we're up against is something that requires immediate action. And so we'll continue to put pressure on this government to respond to the needs of Canadians, to respond to this crisis so that we can have the healthcare that Canadians deserve and the Canadians need. Just as a follow-up, just to dig in a little more there, is the lack of a prompt response from the federal government on these issues, the hospital staff in crisis, that you're talking about today is a is a non-urgent response to that enough to constitute like a deal breaker for your supply and confidence agreement with them and again how much how much time are you willing to give them to actually act on what you're asking for today before it triggers any potential dissolution of that agreement well the agreement is specifically uh, in relation to what we've negotiated so the things that we've called for and those things have to be met for the agreement to continue uh, but that doesn't mean that there's other things that that uh, the government uh, should respond to. It means that there's there's still going to be additional things that come up. And the two things that have recently come up that we've been saying that this government has to respond to is the cost of living going up and now the healthcare crisis that has become really, really front of mind for a lot of Canadians as we continue to see headline after headline about closures, about short staffing, this has become very serious. It was not something that we envisioned at the time of the agreement, so it's not specifically in the agreement, but that doesn't mean we're not gonna raise our voice and say, well, this is something that's come to light now. We know this is a serious problem, and we know that the federal government can actually act in a meaningful way to respond to this crisis and to, to alleviate the worries that Canadians have right now. So we're gonna use our position to raise concerns, to put pressure on this government to act, but ultimately, if the government doesn't act, it is it is a liberal government. It is it is Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. It is their decision not to act, and Canadians will judge that decision. And this concludes the press conference. Merci. Thank you. Thank you. Merci.